Today I'll talk about the best camera settings for landscape photography, explaining the settings, explaining the tool that allows you to control if the settings you choose were correct, and then I'll jump into the studio and show some of my photos, show you the settings for those photos, and explaining a little bit about the thought process that went behind choosing those specific settings. Hello everyone, Photo Tom here, welcome to a new vlog. So today we're talking about the best camera settings for landscape photography. The elements that decide the exposure are exposure time, ISO and aperture. And you also get a tool that lets you control if the exposure was correct and that is the histogram. Making adjustments to those settings is based to be made in stops of light. So, the first half of this video will be about explaining very quickly and very fast these concepts, exposure time, ISO, aperture, histogram, and stops of light. As a landscape photographer, in 80% or 90% of the cases, my camera is on the tripod. So, the first setting that I'm starting with is the ISO. And the ISO refers to how sensitive the sensor is. It's a digital enhancement of the sensor. So, you should not uh, abuse this, but you should also not be afraid of raising the ISO. Now, as I said, because I'm using the tripod, I usually use ISO 100. But whenever I have to boost the ISO, I when I go to ISO 320, 640, uh, even 1250, it's not a problem if the image is correctly exposed. The thing with the ISO is that the higher you raise the ISO, the more noise you're going to have in the photo. But there are moments when you need a higher ISO to compensate for exposure. The thing is this, if by raising the ISO you get a correct exposure and you don't need to raise the shadows some more then you're gonna get a, a decent amount of noise. The problem is when you have a high ISO, let's say 1250 or even higher than that and you still need to bump the exposure and to raise the, the shadows to see the detail. That is the moment when you're gonna get a lot of artifacts, in the shadows especially. Now you may ask, why do I need to raise the ISO if I'm using the tripod? Well, there are some situations. For example, there are elements that are moving and you, you need a, a higher ISO because you need a certain exposure time to freeze the motion of the subject. It can be leaves, it can be a moving subject, it doesn't matter, but you need uh, to raise the ISO in order to have a shorter exposure time to freeze the motion. Now once I set the ISO, the next thing, the next element that I'm going to set is the aperture. And this controls the depth of field, how big the depth of field is. Usually as a landscape photographer I'm using f8, f11, sometimes f16 and if necessary f22. You have to be aware that starting from f16 you're going to get diffraction and this means that the lens is not going to produce an image as sharp as at f11 for example at, or at f16. But sometimes you, you have no choice, you have to use f22. The rule is like this. If I'm having foreground elements that are closer to me, then I'm gonna use f11, sometimes f16. Closer means that I'm having foreground elements, at, let's say two meters from me or one meter and a half. If I'm going uh, under this distance, so if I'm having uh, foreground elements closer than one meter and a half, I may go to f22 or I would uh, make a focus stacking and merge all those photos in uh, in Photoshop. It's a technique where when you ensure that everything is in focus because sometimes you have elements so close to you that no matter the aperture you're still gonna have a depth of field that starts at a certain point and a point a little bit in front of the point of focus but doesn't end to infinity and that causes not having the entire image in sharp so you're doing a photo with the focus here and then a focus there and another one in the distance and then you combine all those photos and you get a sharp image so this is how I'm thinking about the ISO and then the aperture finally I set the exposure time if the elements in front of me doesn't move then it's not a problem setting the exposure time 
whatever just to get the correct exposure and if there are elements that move I, I just ask myself do I want them to capture, capture them um, as they are as a blurred uh, element that it's moving or I want to freeze their motion if I want to freeze their motion I will have to do an exposure time that it's shorter and then I have to raise the ISO or lower the aperture opening the aperture to um, to get more light into the into the camera and capture that uh, the movement in uh, in a frozen frame if you want and after I'm setting those three elements exposure time ISO and aperture I check the histogram on mirrorless you get to see the histogram on the LCD or the viewfinder uh, if you have the DSLR you can take the photo and then look at the histogram or you can also display it on the LCD if you're uh, if you're looking at the LCD but usually when you have a DSLR you're looking directly to the viewfinder as I said you also have a tool to check if everything is in order and that is the histogram now you have two ways of displaying the histogram in a grayscale and that is an average of all of the three color channels but uh, the idea is to display the histogram as color channels now what the histogram displays is the tonal values to the left is black to the right is white and you get um, a graphical representation of how bright the, the different areas of the photo uh, are and you get to see if you have clipping to the left this means that you're having um, areas with complete black in the, in the in the image or the image is clipping to the right and you have areas that are completely blown away completely overexposed why I always recommend to have the histogram displayed as color channels is because there are situations when the red channel can be uh, can become overexposed during sunrise during sunsets or photographing subjects with a lot of red in it flowers people the skin has lots of red and you have a bright light on them the red channel can get overexposed while the average of those three channels may look okay so the grayscale can uh, trick you and you may also have a situation during blue hour or during the night when the blue channel can get overexposed so have the histogram displayed as color channels my advice when setting the exposure is the resulting histogram to be concentrated roughly in the middle there is no uh, perfect recipe for that there are situations when you want to go to the left or want to go to the right it's not a, a perfect solution but if you stay with, the, with your histogram right in the middle you will have no problem of doing adjustments later on on your photo increasing the exposure um, increasing the shadows or uh, compensating the highlights you'll have enough detail captured in that image to be able to adjust it without generating noise without generating artifacts in your photos the exposure you're making it's not going to be always the right one Sometimes you're going to have the exposure slightly to, to the left. This means an, uh, an image that is underexposed or an image that is overexposed. So you need to compensate for that. You need to decide if you have to open the aperture, if you have to raise the ISO, if you want to lower the exposure time to get more light or to increase the exposure time. So you need to make those adjustments. And this is the moment when it's time to talk about the concept of stops of light. The simplest way to explain uh, stops of light is that a stop of light means two times more light or two times uh, less light. When we're talking about ISO and exposure time, this goes by um, multiplying by two or dividing by two the the actual setting. So let's give let's just give you an example. I, ISO 100. If I want uh, one more stop of light, I will go ISO 200. If I want two stops of light. Uh, of overexposure starting from 100 I will have one stop 200 two stops 400 ISO if I'm uh, doing this with the exposure time let's say I have a hundredth of a second okay and I want two uh, two times more light I have to go 50th of a second and I will have one stop of light and this means two times more light uh, if I want to go two, two stops of light of overexposing, uh, starting from a hundredth of a second, I'll have to go at 150th first and then 25th of a second. And I will have two more stops of light uh, of overexposure starting from 
uh, 1 over 100. With the aperture, uh, the stops of light are some set values and you need to learn them. So f2.8, f4, f5.6, f8, f11, f16, f22. So these are the stops of light. So if you're photographing at, let's say, f4 and you want two times uh, more light, you have to go with f2.8. But let's say your lens is just an f4, then you boost the, the, the exposure by increasing the ISO or by uh, lowering the exposure time. If you are at f11 and you want two times more light, this meaning one stop of light of overexposing, you have to go to f8. Or if you want to underexpose one stop of light, you go to f16, you're closing the aperture. When you're having a more closed aperture, the higher the number in the aperture means that it's closed because again, it's one by 11, one by 16. So that's the short explanation for exposure time, ISO, aperture, histogram, and the concept of stops of light. Um, for the moment, if you have questions about any uh, of this, just use the comment section below. I'll be happy to uh, explain some more. And now let's jump into the studio and talk about some of my photos, show the settings and just uh, talk about the thought process that went behind choosing those specific settings for those photos. So we're in the studio and I want to show you some of my photos with the settings and I want to discuss the settings and the thought process that went behind choosing those settings. Before I start, I want to let you know that I want to record a video, me reacting to your photos and offering you critique and uh, ideas uh, based on your photos. So to do that, in the description of this video, there's a link to a Facebook group you can go there, uh, join the group, and there's a post. The first post of the group tells you about this idea that I have, and you post your photos as comments to those uh, to that uh, particular post. Also, if you want to check my gear, also uh, you can find uh, in the description of this video affiliate links to every gear that I have. So go check it out, and you can support me by purchasing one if you're interested. Now let's. Uh, continue this video. Let's start with this first photo. It's a um, it's an image from uh, Norway in Lofoten Island. Uh, there was a sunset going on, and as you can see, I have 24 millimeters f11, 208 second exposure, and ISO 50. Now. The reason for having 24 millimeter in a situation like this is, of course, to have a foreground element and um, to 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 capture it. Now, the wider the lens, the the more emphasis uh, the foreground element gets. So you need to you need to find a balance because the background will go, will become smaller and smaller. So you need to be aware of um, of that. F11, of course, uh, because the foreground is so close to me, I want to make sure that everything is in focus. Because I'm doing a long exposure, and as you can see, 208 seconds is a really long exposure. It's um, it's difficult to make multiple shots. So I just wanted to to do uh, one shot, and I found out that f11 was more than enough. Uh, 208 seconds was to calm the water. Now, if I went with ISO 100, then I would have uh, 104 seconds. So um, uh, perhaps at that moment I realized that 100 seconds is not enough to calm the water completely so that is the reason for having ISO 50 of course for this shot I used a tripod second shot this is again a photo from uh, Lofoten Islands and I'm uh, having a 19 millimeter focal length f22 again to have everything in sharp because um, these rocks in the foreground were really close to me but um, I wanted to to capture the, the movement of the water. So that's why I experimented and I uh, ended up with ISO 50 and one eighth of a, one eighth of a second. So I, I don't have a milky smooth water, but I, uh, I think I captured it. I captured really well the movement of, of the water. And now you can, you, can, you, you have a, a feel of, of, uh, of how the, the water was, the dynamic. Of the situation. This was a, a family portrait. Um, we took a trip and uh, 
I was photographing along the trip and I also took uh, Maria, my daughter and Monica, my wife with me. Uh, here we were camping on some mountain and um, I used the 35 millimeter because I was able to use an aperture of 2.2. Uh, and as you can see, even with 2.2 aperture and ISO 1600, I still get only one tenth of a second. Now we had to stay very, very still. And we also use our headlamps to shine some light on our, uh, on our faces. Uh, ideally, I would have had at least one twentieth, one fiftieth of a second. But there are situations when you have to compromise. Now, the moment chosen for this photo, as you can see, it's, it's not completely dark. And it, it, was, um, it was an intent uh, to, an intent of mine to uh, have this photo taken at, during blue hour. Because uh, if the sky would have been completely black, I think it would have lacked uh, some, uh, some character. This photo again a portrait of me and Maria. I took I took Maria with me in the forest when there was some fog and um, I photographed and then I took this portrait of, of us. I use an 85 millimeter focal length, only f4, and the reason for that is I wanted a little bit of blur behind me, uh, one fiftieth of a second, more than enough to uh, have ourselves sharp and clear we're not moving so it's more than enough and then i saw 400 so uh, even though we are in the middle of the day inside the forest is pretty dark so i had to raise the iso in order to have that 150th of a second next photo a sunrise in the dolomites and um ha I've, I've been using uh the 17 millimeter uh, focal length f16 because i have lots of rocks in the foreground and really close to the camera and then i have iso 105 seconds now i could have i could have raised the iso value and uh i, I could get i could have got uh, an, an exposure time that maybe would be shorter but i really like that i was able to to have this five second because I, I have a little bit of movement in the cloud if you see in the upper part of the photo I have the clouds and there's a little bit of movement there whenever I have the chance to capture movement of elements I jump to it I, I just do it uh, as, a, as, as an instinct because I think it adds another dimension to the photo it's like you're looking and you see you see those moving clouds and in your head you're starting to think okay maybe it was windy that day that's why it looks like this uh, this was a really snowy day and uh, I used 24 millimeters uh, that that's obvious uh, uh, the reason is obvious to capture the road and also capture the big uh, the big rock in the in the background and by the way the big rock in the background it's called the altar stone I had f6.3 and I had to uh, have this this uh, aperture usually I'm at f8 or f11 but I had to be at 6.3 and I saw 640 to get the exposure time of 1 over 250 50th of a second the reason for that is because whenever it's snowing I don't like having um, the the snowflakes like small lines if you're not if i'm not able to freeze the motion uh, because of the light i'm not doing the photo because for me it looks it looks strange with all those lines if you have an exposure time that doesn't freeze the motion of the snowflake then I, for me at least it doesn't look okay now so a side tip when you're photographing in snowing conditions like this uh, you have to be careful that your focus is not uh, is not still by one of the snowflakes so uh, usually it's best for you to do the focus ensure that the focus is is where you want and then leave it that way another photo this is a portrait i'm using natural light coming from one side uh, actually it's a door and i place the subject in a really dark barn if you want 
and this way I have a, a really good separation uh, between the subject and the background element. Now I'm using the 50 millimeter at f2.2 and 2.2 it's not, uh, I mean 2.8 would have been a lot better um, because I at, at, at 2.2 the, the depth of field is really really narrow at 50 millimeter so I think that 2.8 would have been a lot better uh, a lot more of the subject would have been in sharp but I had to stay at 2.2 because as you can see I have 2.2 aperture ISO 640 and I only get 1 uh, 80th of a second which is not uh, which is not a lot. Now this, the, this lens, the 50 millimeter, doesn't have image stabilization so I need to be, usually I want to be at, at least 100th of a second. Uh, here I was getting close. Uh, and uh, another side tip, when I'm photographing portraits like this, I always um, have one side of the face completely lit by the natural light and the other side of the of the face, it doesn't. I'm not after the Rembrandt light, but I want to see some a little streak of light on the other side of the face. And I always photograph positioning myself on that side of the face that it's not that well uh, lit. And the last photo that I want to talk about, it's a photo that I made with the camera handheld, uh, 135 millimeter f 5.6. 200th of a second and ISO 640. Whenever I have to shoot with the camera handheld, I make sure that the the exposure time is almost almost double the focal length. This ensures that I have a crisp, sharp photo. Now I hope this video was useful for you. If you really like it, then subscribe and share it with your friends. And until next time, keep on photographing because it's the only way to get better. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.